Are you guys enjoying um, ECC? Good? First time? How many times you guys came? Like, second time? Twice? Three times? Once? Cool, cool. Um, yeah, so my name is Julian Boutelou. Uh I've been in space for quite some time. Some time and um, so I'm involved in Curve Finance, uh, which is probably the biggest auto market maker for stable coins. I'm also involved in Rect, the news. You guys know Rect? Nice, nice, nice. I've got, I've got, I've got a surprise for you guys. Um, Blackpool, which is also like um, one of the biggest NFT quantitative hedging trading firm. We um, the biggest one on Sorare, Axie Infinity, top three, like pretty big. And also Stake DAO, which is providing the best APY in the ecosystem. So the, um, the topic of this, uh, this, uh, panel, th th this uh, stage was about um, auto market maker, why they're eating the world. And uh, well, as I mentioned, Curve is um, between 8 and 10 billion TVL, making 250 million US dollars, between 250 million US dollars to 1 billion US dollars volume per day. And then we have like other market makers that are using a different, um, a different um, like formula, uh, like Uniswap, um, SushiSwap, and all that stuff. But before we get into that and then go into questions, I think uh, what I want to do, I want to show you guys the video. It's a video that will bring you into um, like the vibe of this ecosystem. I'm sure you guys have been inside this ecosystem for, for a long time, or for the new ones that are just uh, joined. I, just, I think like the direct Opium video will give you an introduction of what is blockchain and this new revolution. So if you can send the video now, it's about, it's about like 10, 12 minutes, and then we can have questions and uh, question about um, auto market maker, curve, and, and technical questions if you guys want, or more uh, business uh, and uh, diplomats, like, like governance, worldwide governance, and all this stuff. Can we send the video? Opium Diaries, Dystopian Dreams in which our anonymous author takes a trip through time, looks the zeitgeist in the eye, and sees the narrative of a new financial world being carved out in zeros and ones. The fire grows hotter. Visionaries who kindle the early flames are not surprised to see the turning heads of the once doubtful elite. The stubborn few still remain with their backs to the blaze, seemingly prepared to stay that way until they are engulfed by the advancing inferno. Yet again, voices cry out that we are at boiling point, that now is the time to rise from the ashes and let loose the financial revolution. But is this level of optimism deserved? Burnt by the growing heat of the technological furnace, the closest skeptics melt away, Sneers turn to self-seeking strategy and cynics cry for redemption or amnesia as they shun their past beliefs and join the line to fuel the fire. Bullish news updates fan the flames of this new financial era. But can the light shine through the peaks and troughs of this dark and volatile market? The inevitability. The race for digital currency has reached a governmental level. Behind the scenes, the United States, Europe, and China are scrambling to understand and regulate this technology, whilst fighting to not get swept away by the flow of innovation. To maintain a competitive edge, existing financial systems have to accept some loss of control and swim with the current rather than fight to close the floodgates. As the world realizes the redundancy of the greedy middleman, empowerment will flow across all industries as unprecedented forms of monetization emerge. A new generation. Children born into the uncertain era of the coronavirus will reach adolescence 
in a strange new world, one of invasive and total monetization. The whole media industry will be overtaken and empowered by social tokens, bringing a breath of fresh air to the creative industries, which depend so much on their online followings to succeed. In the modern technopoly, the greatest challenges are psychological, as the undisciplined mind is easily lost to social media, endlessly scrolling into the unknown. Global politics will become increasingly polarized, yet the invincibility of uncensorable code will appeal to libertarians and bohemians alike. With shrewd investments from industry leaders, innovative development continues. The cycle of change becomes tighter and technological advancements accelerate. A new economy will arise, self-started careers will flourish, and increased remote working combined with globalized currencies will begin to level the playing field as a technological meritocracy becomes the economic standard. The altruistic applications of Web 3.0 will change the public perception of charity and matured DAOs will become household names just as non-governmental organizations are today. However, not all DAO activity will win the approval of the public. Governance protocol wars will scale drastically and as the battle for power between banks, big tech and governments becomes more aggressive, we will see complex game theory being utilized as a weapon to manipulate not just protocols, but entire democracies. The tension between the US, China and the EU will escalate, and decentralized currencies increase instability as countries lose control of their printing machines. China will be quick to tokenize yuan and issue it on-chain, forcing the US to adapt or get left behind. Governments will have to incentivize their citizens to use their native currency over the decentralized alternative. Some will enforce this by law, while others will take a more liberal approach. But an alternative global economy will develop regardless. During this radical transition, some citizens will suffer while their neighbors prosper as different leaders take their own approach to regulation and apply different limitations upon their people. Those who allow for total financial freedom still face dangers as the unexpecting public become exposed to the experienced hackers and slick arbitrageurs of the decentralized underworld. Nations will not only be forced to create and adapt to an on-chain economy in their own country, but also learn to defend themselves against interference from attacking states which try to disrupt and influence their politics by any means necessary. Certain governments will restrict or eliminate tools of our industry which are most exposed to regulation, such as stable coins or centralized exchanges. Users of Coinbase or Tether are at the mercy of the corporations which own them and ultimately the governments which regulate said corporations. Fanning the flames. We'll look back on DeFi summer with nostalgia, a naive but entertaining time where we forged gamified concepts that later became utilitarian applications. Bitcoin faded away during the birth of DeFi, but it never lost its status. Its return to the limelight was inevitable and the global turmoil of 2020 only strengthened the appeal of BTC as an investment. With the benefit of hindsight, we'll see that DeFi summer brought increased liquidity and volatility to the markets, capturing the attention of some larger players who used their influence to turn the eye of the market onto the large cap currencies where they feel most comfortable. Optimism around Bitcoin and Ethereum continues to rise, triggered in 2020 by bullish news from established financial institutions such as JPM, Square, and MicroStrategy. 
Those who are bold enough to look the zeitgeist in the eye and place their bets accordingly will reap huge rewards over the coming years as the narrative of the new financial world is carved out in zeros and ones. A tokenized world. Unfortunately, tribalism never fades away entirely. Conflict-loving maximalists will always try to smear the work of others. But as cross-chain interoperability and tokenization becomes commonplace, the arguments will become less passionate. The quantity of Bitcoin on the Ethereum network started to increase rapidly in 2020. By the third quarter, it had increased by over 13,000% from 1,100 wrapped Bitcoins in January to 150,000 in late October. We now look back on 2020 as a tipping point for tokenization, not just of Bitcoin, but of real-world assets, as FTX offered trading of tokenized Tesla shares on-chain for the first time. The ability to tokenize physical assets results in financial ruin for the less disciplined gambler, as they are able to use their real-world assets as on-chain collateral. Court cases will be opened in the hundreds or thousands as the prices of private company stocks are copied onto the blockchain, allowing speculators to trade the volatility in a mirrored financial market that pays nothing to the middleman. Bitcoin treasuries in publicly traded companies will continue to grow with Square's purchase of approximately 4,709 bitcoins at an aggregate purchase price of $50 million being one of the most eye-catching announcements of this kind in 2020. With an economic environment prime for inflation, Jack Dorsey saw a growing role for bitcoin and he was not alone in doing so. When publicly traded companies purchase bitcoin, it is a treasury management decision, not speculation. Post-2020, having some percentage of the company treasury in Bitcoin becomes a common promotional narrative, encouraging other businesses to invest for the publicity as well as the potential profit. Dollars and cents. Learning in public will become a widely recognized form of career progression and numerically-minded autodidacts will thrive. As the multi-million dollar hacks and exploits that are so common in cryptocurrency start to reach the mainstream news, ambitious students willing to bend the rules will start to choose computer science and software development over accounting or business studies. However, white hat hackers will also be in high demand and as hacking or exploiting grows harder over time and new standards emerge, the safety of the entire industry will improve. Multiple billion dollar companies will be founded by small teams of young developers working from only a laptop and thus the balance of power will shift. The non-stop globalized nature of this new open financial industry will encourage companies to geographically diversify their workforces and skills or experience will be valued over qualifications. COVID-19 has had a lasting impact on the global economy and some industries will never recover. Some jobs will be lost to the new technology as wherever profitable, the inefficient human employee is replaced by a sophisticated smart contract or well-trained AI. A human employee is costly and unpredictable. The code operates as instructed. The DeFi market cap may fall. It may even drop by 80% or more. But the best projects will inevitably come back stronger. Eventually, banks will race to use DeFi, if not for the yield, and merely for the savings on their daily transactions. When the first Western High Street Bank 
begins to offer DeFi level interest rates to their customers, the floodgates will open and all banks will implement the technology, shaking up councils and governments across the world. Decentralization will be measured on a spectrum, with full DeFi providing little to no safety net in the form of customer service or refunds, and their centralized counterparts providing a more familiar, safer space, but with less flexibility and control over the user's funds. Jumping the hurdles. Progress will not be linear. There will be hurdles, restrictions, scams, and market crashes. However, the shared vision is key. This industry and the desire for financial freedom is not going away. The only uncertainty is how, not if, we will arrive at our goal of mass adoption. A world based on maths, code, and binary liquidation is not for everyone, and watered-down aspects of DeFi will be provided for those who are uncomfortable with barebacking smart contracts via Etherscan. Centralized entities will remain for those who are uncomfortable with the risks and responsibility of owning your own private keys, and the spectrum of DeFi will expand to cover the entire financial system. The flame that burns twice as bright burns half as long. We must focus on the trend and not the volatility. Our goal is not to light up the room, but to illuminate a path to a new financial system that the entire world can follow. Let's not build more experiments for the experts, but instead create tools that welcome newcomers that invite them in and provide a better future that empowers us all. Nice, nice. You guys uh, give like some uh, shiver down your spin, right? Like, uh, it's good because the market is down today, like got pretty pretty savagely smashed. But when you watch this, you understand that the future is really bright. Um, yeah, so I think that was just, I thought like instead of giving a slide and deck about auto market maker and, and how this is actually transforming the world, um, this video give you a, a good introduction uh, to the space and how um, finance is getting disrupted by DeFi and how like small projects such as Curve or Aave, Landing Market, Trading are basically completely taking control or replacing traditional finance. But um, I think we can go, because I didn't have much time, so I think we can go like some, for, for some questions, like if you guys have questions from the audience. Yeah. Tell us more about Tell the, the, the story. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, so on the auto market, like, like for example, like, like, like Curve. The story is in this space. What would be more important than money is actually uh, lobby, and lobby comes with uh, governance. So basically, the idea was knowing that, for example, in auto market maker, in traditional finance, for example, the FX is doing six trillion US dollars volume a day. So if you think about it, and you're like, Curve, for example, is doing between 250 million up to 1 million volume a day. If we take like 1% or 10% of the entire volume on the traditional finance market, like FX, we're talking about like billions. So we're talking like, like could potentially do like 100 billion volume a day. And the thing is like, what you realize is those different protocols, what would be more important is not actually putting money and being a liquidity provider, it's actually being a governance, being a lobby. So you can actually control what kind of assets you can add on the top of, of Curve, for example. And you can also like incentivize those different stable coins. And Rate showed that stable coins are becoming 
the most important bit, like the most important part, one of the most important part in DeFi because it's a war nation state. When you control the money, you control the, the, the power, and you can actually distribute your own money across the, the globe, and as soon as people start using your money, you basically have the, the lobby, you have the power to do whatever you want, like price uh, a barrel of oil or send some commodities across the globe and everyone start pricing your assets in a, in a, in a national currency. So what, I, what I'm trying to say is on Curve, we have like now a war that is going. We have Asia, Europe and US that are all fighting like we're talking about millions of US dollars to get their stable coin on the platform because when they get on the platform, we incentivize them. It means that they actually print cash. It's like it's a, it's a cash machine. And for example, like USDC, USDT, all those different assets, now they have a good portions of control globally on, on a DeFi space. And now we have other assets like Euro or EN or whatever that are coming on board. And so Stake DAO was a project that the goal, the initial goal, was to control a little bit of the voting power. So we got whitelisted in Curve, and now what we do is like using this percentage of power, we can boost our strategy. And if you go online and you check, that's the reason we don't provide many different strategies, but we provide four of them, Euro, US dollars, BTC, and ETH, and they are the best APY on the market. And we do that because we use our boost and we don't build too many strategies. And um, answer your questions? Yeah, so then you have like in this war, you have like three different projects that are trying to compete. I mean, at the end of the day, we're all friends because it's not a who, who win. At the end of the day, Curve wins. So the auto market maker wins. So we are like Yearn, Convex, and Stake DAO. They're all, they're all fighting each other to get the most voting power. But then this will move into new projects, or I mean existing projects like Ave, basically like trying to compete for the voting power because when you have power, you have, you have control on the money and the, and the market. And um, I just mentioned like direct video was built in six months by a very small team of three people. And I think this is pretty impressive. Um, yeah, all the stuff that you see on the, on, the, on the video, each 10 seconds, it's actually a piece of art. It was designed, put together, the music, the voice, you got some caviars inside if you if you search really deep. Cool. Another questions? Yes. Hello. Hey, Julian. Um, I wanted to ask your thoughts about how do you think we can bring AMMs and DEXs uh, basically mainstream? Of course, you just said that because Euro and CNY, maybe in USD, might also want to onboard into Curve and AMMs, but I'd also like to know if you if you've thought of alternatives, as in fiat on ramps or banks offering services through the um, through DeFi to it's customers. Diffi it's difficult to hear you. I'm not sure the voice. Yeah. Is this better? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes. So I just wanted to know your thoughts on how AMMs and DEXs can grow and reach mainstream uh, adoption apart from the Euro, CNY, USD, whatever, joining actually Curve and AMMs. Thank you. So the question is about like making new payments on top of Curve? Yes, about how, how do you bring more users and more TVL? Yeah, I, I think like, as you see, in like the, the entire world is now fighting to get control of, of, of blockchain. I mean, if you take a look to the EN, the paper a couple of days ago, they said that Bitcoin, blockchain, cryptocurrencies, they were like fraud, scams, there's not, like, this is, this, is, this is not good, Ethereum is not good, but they're building their own coin at the end of the day, and they actually might use Ethereum, that's, that's why it's actually funny. But the thing is like, I think like central banks, all those big institutions, since now they understand that it's a technology that cannot be controlled, is accessible by all, and built by everyone, at the end of the day, if they don't actually start using the, the, or building their own technology, then we'll be taking over their business. And what they're trying to do right now is trying to build, for example, like Fab, uh, Facebook with Libra or like other, other um, uh, central bank and nation states. That's, that's actually what they're doing. And I'm sure 
And that in China now, like apparently like by next year, a huge portion of the population is saying that we'll be actually using the digital yen. And this will, it's actually kind of like dangerous in a sense because they have like, I, like national identification system mechanism that they can track everyone. But every company like PayPal, PayPal now you can actually cash out, you can buy crypto but also sell crypto to the platform. So all those biggest companies are actually coming on board and they are providing their own technology which is a little bit censored. But for us it's a good opportunity to just make it like, like broader and, and, more, and spread the word about it, the technology. Yeah. And I mean stablecoin is like, is how you can build any technology right now. Yeah, if you use stablecoin in your business, then you can just sell it across the globe. Yeah. Other questions? Hey, Julian. Oh, I will go here. Hey, Julian, thanks. Um, do, do you think stablecoins are a special case of, do you think the winning platform that wins stablecoins is also going to win the rest of synthetic assets, or do you think, you know, 10 years from now, the uh, synthetic equities or something else can be traded on a different platform than stable coins? Good, good questions. I mean, Synthetix is the, it's the biggest market in the world. You know, like, uh, we're talking about trillions. Um, um, stable coin, like, like, like on Curve, it's not like necessarily just currencies. It can be any assets. It just depends how you price them. So, for example, on Curve, you have ETH and BTC. So there's just like normal asset, a volatile asset, but because inside the pool, you have different way, different oracles or different way of building those assets. If you pull them into your same pool, then they are stable between each other. So that's what, that's what actually make, uh, we can see real estate, bonds, national debts, all those different things coming. But the synthetics market, derivatives market, is like, it's way bigger than the, the, the FX market. And this will think about having um, on those auto market maker, the ability to add in less than 10 seconds any asset in the world. And then we won't be talking about 250 million or 1 billion US dollars volume a day. We'll be talking about trillions volume a day. And this will be completely accessible to anyone in the world. But I'm sure like governments, banks, hedge funds, like they will actually fight to not, for this to not happen. Because right now, if you think about it, you can make a trade of 100 million US dollars, for example, on Curve. It will take less than 10 minutes. We'll have the almost no slippage and zero cost, like 0. Point, like, like 0.5 percent fees. If you were to do that in traditional market, like my background used to be like quant. I used to do like like high frequency trading and all those things. If you do that in traditional market, it will take months because you need to do like um, see, um, collateral party sign sign a deal between banks, between lawyers. It will take three months. Well, here what you can do is like, you know, like we, we saw like the the emerging of like Revolut, TransferWise, all those different platforms that were offering swap but charging a high fees, and you need to KYC, AML, and all this stuff. Here you can just like do a massive swap from US dollars to Euro or Euro from EN soon without asking anyone question and without paying any fees almost. And the fees that you're paying are actually being distributed to the people that are providing liquidity. Which is like, yeah. But the, 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 the derivatives, synthetics markets, it's, it's uh, I think when we get into that, we won't realize, but it will be a completely different DeFi space, yeah. Hello. Yeah. Hey, Julian. Um, thank you so much. And I definitely agree with a lot of what you're saying. Um, one, I, you kind of answered the question I'm going to ask now, but I mean, other than smart contract risk and sort of governments and, and sort of trying to stop this, what other risks do you see um, sort of for everything that you're saying, right? What other things do you think that will sort of stop or impede the growth? Because um, I definitely think one of the biggest ones is sort of governments not allowing it, but yeah. Well, it's um, AML, KYC, what people are trying to, um, institutions, governments are basically now saying, I'm not sure if you saw like the news on, the, well, a couple of months ago, the SEC said that the biggest risk of the US is not actually war or countries in the world that are um, either attacking or they're, they're going after the business, capitalism and all that stuff. It's actually 
uh, crypto. It's actually stablecoin because it completely changed the monetary system worldwide. It's not like central banks um, like printing money and then selling to commercial banks and then they actually distribute it in, in terms of debts. But what, what's happening is now what they're doing is they said like anyone that was in the FATS, FATS documents, they said that what they want is anyone building smart contracts or anyone just doing providing liquidity on an auto market maker or lending platform such as Aave, they need to be regulated, which is like kind of like impossible. Like saying that is just like it, it, they don't understand the technology because you cannot stop or regulate. I mean, we need regulation, but those what they're trying to do because now they're scared. They're just trying to completely stop it and use the technology for themselves and then make money without giving the, the, the back to the people on the ground. But yeah, they're just like completely trying to stop. I think the biggest risk for us is, is right now it's, it's, it's like lobby, lobbying. Yeah, it's not necessarily governments because the governments is just listen to lobbying. But lobbying right now, they're just trying to take control of it. Yeah, and then stop you from using the technology. Or this, for example, I got um, three days ago, I got three, three of my bank accounts got shut down. Like, because apparently I, I was sending money or receiving money from, from some exchanges. So they're attacking, they're just coming. But the thing, like, if you look at the story of Bitcoin, um, I mean, 10 years later, people were saying like it was a scam, a fraud, like massive banks, JP Morgan said it was the biggest fraud in history, it's a bubble and all that stuff. Well, it's still alive, they couldn't stop it, and now they're trying to start using it. So right, I think it's, it's kind of dangerous. I mean, but as, as long as you build and provide utility for people, I think you shouldn't be afraid of the regulation trying to stop you, because this will happen anyway. anyway. Good, no more questions. That's it. Thank you guys.